can be more different than five, six years ago when we were in the Hellenic Center, much more humble surroundings. And that was the first Reload Greece conference. But Reload Greece is nothing if not setting the bar high. And when they jump over it, they just pick it up and set it higher. And that's all about um, the next panel who flew from around the world to come and talk to us about how to set the bar even higher than it is today. Reload Greece um, accelerated 100 startups over the past six years. We want to do twice as much in half the time now. And we just don't want only to accelerate. We want to create these unique global leaders. And that's what the, the panel is here to talk to us about. Um, Chris Chrysanthu, Nick Bonatas, can you come up to the stage, please? And of course, moderated by David Rowan, editor-in-chief and founder of Wild. Kari Stock, good morning. Well done, everybody, giving up your Saturday to come and save, revive the Greek economy. Um, thank you. I'm David Rowan. I'm former editor of Wired. I set up Wired um, nine years ago as a magazine to tell the story about the people building the future, um, entrepreneurs, designers, architects, scientists. Um, and I'm now... I got a bit addicted to the entrepreneur side and spent too much time with founders, and I'm now spending quite a lot of my time advising them, investing in them, and I got quite excited about the opportunity in Athens. In fact, I now have a Greek tax number because I've just bought an apartment in Athens, and that was not a, that was not a digital experience. <laughs> but one of the things that excited me is I've seen how an ecosystem like Lisbon has just taken off because with government support and with some talent coming out of the universities, they realized that there was a huge opportunity to build value fast. And we're going to talk about the opportunity for the talent with an ecosystem of advisors, mentors, and investors around them to create new economic value in Greece. Um, Nico Bonatzos from General Cap Catalyst, here from San Francisco. Um, Nick, you've invested in some amazing businesses like Snap, Cover, Class Dojo. Just tell us, first of all, when you are assessing entrepreneurs to decide whether to invest, what is it you are looking for? Sure. Excited to be here among all the Greeks, so thank you for having me. Thank you to Reload Greece. So what am I looking for? Uh, looking for founders for uh, learning animals, uh, often invest in first-timers, and uh, they don't have the experience, but they have a lot of imagination. Um, and um, the expectation from our side is that over four or five years' time, they would become world-class um, in their field. So that if we put them in the room with a Fortune 500 CEO of a company in their field, that person would feel intimidated. So treating every decision, every meeting, every day as a learning opportunity uh, is number one. Number two is individuals who are insanely ambitious because fortunately or unfortunately, the economics of a large venture fund platform that I'm a partner of, we need to return many billions of dollars to our limited partners. So founders that we work with have to be ambitious to go the distance and create a world-changing company. And lastly, uh, looking for founders who are extremely authentic, paranoid, have a chip on their shoulder, something that keeps them going when shit hits the fan. Because doing a startup is not for normal people. It's for the crazy ones. It's for folks who are obsessed with solving a problem their own way and they cannot get it out of their system. So there should be a deeper reason or calling for whatever they're building. So Chris's fund has... I think raised five billion dollars so far, so he he's goes. going to be a popular guy. At, I, I sorry, wish we had raised Nick's uh, fund. <laughs> um, Chris Chrysanthu, partner at Kindred Capital in London, um, formerly at Axel at Notion, and you've been involved in investments such as Hellas Direct and Workable. Um, you've had a B two B, a business to business focus in the past, but yeah. do you look for similar things, or are there certain assets 
a twinkle in the eye that makes you think, I want to work with this entrepreneur? Yeah, we, it's funny. Last week we were trying to define um, what, is, what kind of entrepreneur we're looking for and what are those characteristics. And we had done a similar exercise back at Notion and uh, we actually got uh, scolded by a few people because we, were, we used the F word in our definition that you have to have that F U attitude to, um, to survive the journey. But I would totally agree with, uh, with Nigos on, on a lot of the characteristics. The only difference we've seen a little bit from a B2B towards B2C is uh, it's much easier, well, much easier, it's never easy, but it's relatively easier for B2C to be a first time entrepreneur. Uh, from a B2B perspective, um, especially in markets such as security or a lot more deeper industrial software, we found that expertise and deeper domain knowledge about what they're doing definitely helps in selling in front of the right buyers or uh, building the right teams around them. But the characteristics in terms of um, uh, insanity or on the verge of insanity and being able to tear down walls uh, having their own conviction, but at the same time being open to listen and evolve and continue to build an amazing team around them. So there's a lot of different characteristics that we've written down, but we also, as we talk to founders, we try to tease out to see if they're gonna be there for their journey. What are their motivations? Uh, one of the things that we spend a lot of time on is, um, I personally and my partners, in, is on the childhood uh, path. Because a lot of times we've figured out that between the ages of um, zero to 10 or even slightly later on, you get formed and those experiences define you. My, one of my partners asked, uh, one of his favorite questions is, what is the most traumatic thing you've experienced before the age of 15? Good. Because that will, that will define a lot of your drivers of why you're trying to tear down those walls, why you're trying to build that business. What's the craziest answer? Um, I don't know what he's heard, uh, but I've heard a lot like we just invested in, a, in an entrepreneur who, um, and she publicly says it, so I, I think it's okay for me to say, uh, she's building a new form of tampon because tampons today that women use are toxic and she's uh, building a, a, a tampon made out of hemp which is non-toxic. And she got her period at nine years old. She had cervical cancer at 13 through, throughout this journey. So she's been on a mission since then to destroy this industry, to reinvent it. Um, so that, that's the kind of drive we're, we're looking for, um, wherever you're from, whether you're from Greece or uh, whichever planet you're from. It's actually one of my investment criteria that the founder ideally didn't get on particularly with his or her dad. <laughs> Try and find Not just that. billionaire as well. parents and the kid then rebels and the billionaire cuts the kid out of the legacy. And that gives them a hunger because it's about taking on a difficult problem and not choosing the easy life. What's gonna give you that resilience? So we're here to talk about building Greek unicorns and we're gonna, by 10.30, have helped generate a few unicorns from the people in the room. You look at an ecosystem like Tallinn and Estonia, a country of 1.3 million people, yet they claim $4 billion companies, you know, transfer-wise, um, Taxify. You look at a still relatively young ecosystem like Lisbon, and they're putting a claim on Farfetch, although London does as well, um, and then there's talk desk. I mean, there's growth there. Why have we not yet had Athens on that list? So, um, Estonia is a great example because um, I think the founding of the Estonian tech ecosystem owes a lot to Skype. Skype is not worldwide acknowledged as an Estonian company, but uh, the tech team and hundreds of engineers were based out of there. And when you have a massive success, um, this um, creates a, a lot of unbelievable externalities and positive effects. So a lot of the Skype uh, engineers became angel investors, started their own companies, uh, had a broad network all over the world. And this is what helped uh, catalyze the creation of the next companies, some of which you mentioned, that are doing really, really well. So in essence, we haven't yet had um, any uh, phenomenal company 
that either had a side of a, a smaller office in, 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 in Greece or any founders who got started in Greece and broke out and are well known. In recent years, we've started hearing more and more about some really good examples. So for example, Workable, a company that Greece has been an investor in since the very beginning. That's coming, they got started in Greece. Now they have an office in Boston. They've raised a lot of capital from UK, Israeli, and American VCs. So, and, and that founder is still serving as a role model. He's an angel investor in a number of companies. Can I, can I disturb the flow? Um, actually, on that point, to me, that has the potential not for ideally becoming a Skype at some point, but if you think about where Nikos and Spiros, the founders of Workable, started, they spun out of Upstream, which is a relatively successful company in Greece. And to me, that's the kind of need that you have that Sky replicated in Estonia and other countries. They spun out of uh, Upstream and created Workable, which is doing well, uh, and it's five, six years old. And I've been encouraging the founders at some point to start spinning out some of their early employees as well when they reach scale to continue fueling that kind of uh, giving back or, or enabling growth. And there's another company that spun out of Upstream as well that's doing relatively well in New York. And that's what you need. You need those kind of repeat uh, entrepreneurs. So, so you totally need that. Actually, this past week was the first, um, it was the IPO of a company called Upwork that got started by two Greek guys. One of them has always been based out of Greece. That's not well known. Uh, this company was called Odesk. And uh, Odesk is a leading uh, online labor marketplace. And the co-founder, VP of engineering for that company, was always based in Athens from day one and built an engineering team there. But because he's the tech type and not the business development kind of person, he's not well known, hasn't created a following. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is I was an undergrad in Greece, so and I, I, I graduated like 12 years ago or so. I had never met anybody when I was at one of the top schools for engineering in Greece uh, in the 2000s who wanted to start a company or uh, was eager to join a startup. Like this was not part of the mentality. Everybody was eager back then uh, to either go and do a PhD if they were uh, ambitious on the academic side of things or join uh, uh, a mobile uh, telco company because this was, at least in the beginning of my studies, the, golden, the gold rush uh, industry. Or towards the end of uh, our studies, go and join one of the solar panel companies because they were getting a lot of subsidies from the government. So this was the mentality back then. I think what we heard from Effie today, the crisis created a an incredible opportunity because it got people to feel uncomfortable and, and, and think about not looking for a job, but trying to create one for themselves. But it also came at a cost. 400,000 young people leave. Yeah. That talent is lost until they feel motivated to come back thinking the opportunities inside Greece are strong enough. Yeah. How, how do we get them back? Hmm. You want to start? The, the, the magic, uh, um, uh, the answer that everyone's looking for. Um, if you look, there's a new fund, a uh, relatively new fund in Greece called Marathon um, that's actually following a very, and I think George is here today, I don't know if he's here already, but uh, they're following a very interesting strategy, uh, which instead of just looking at uh, startups in Greece, they're, they're flying around all of Europe and uh, running mini events in every city in Europe. They're in Luxembourg, I think, next week, trying to source all these talent that has either escaped or is studying in those countries and is building something or is thinking about building something to catch them early. And they're trying to help them as they're setting up their company to also set up um, an office in Greece to employ a lot of these young smart engineers that might otherwise go to a Microsoft or something like that. Obviously, it's not ideal for them to have a split team initially, but with our, a global world and a flat world, I think it's much easier nowadays for better communication and collaboration. Uh, Workable, for example, is a, did that uh, as well. And I think you got to show them that it's going to be a long journey. It's not going to be an overnight uh, transition, but you have to show them that ability to source talent, being able to build something, and then hopefully within 10 to 20 years, as this ecosystem evolves, you're going to get there. I'm hopeful because 
as I said earlier, we look for people that have been through trauma or who have been through something. And unfortunately, and I'm going to be a generalist now, which is bad, but um, the previous generation of Greeks lived under the, uh, the affluence or uh, what, the, what their parents gave them. And the current generation that is coming out is going through this trauma, which I think is going to fuel them even more to, to tear down those walls that we were talking about. So I'm very hopeful that the ability to show that you can actually build some of these successful companies, being able to source real technical talent, uh, will, it, will attract some of these people to come back. It's not going to be overnight, right? So let's work out the ingredients we need to optimize the conditions for very valuable businesses being built using technology in Athens. I mean, I followed closely Lisbon's emergence. And, you know, they had some of the things that Athens has, you know, strong technical universities. But the government took an active role in creating the conditions where it was attractive, not just for local talent, but for international talent to come. You know, in Portugal, the government put three million euros into getting the Web Summit there, which starts to put it on the map. What do, what do you think, Nico, we need from both government and the private sector to change the game? Sure. I'm not a policymaker, and, and I'm sure we're going to hear from some good people later on. So what do we need? So we need a lot of role models, as we discussed before, because these are the folks who are going to inspire everybody. And the young person who's getting started now or thinking about getting started is going to be like, oh, that guy or gal is not smarter than me. I can do it. Um, so that's number one. Number two, we need, um, for an ecosystem in the periphery, we need uh, to be in the next wave of tech innovation. So when it's a question of imagination, not a question of distribution, things are much easier. So for the Lisbon ecosystem and for some of the other ones that now look pretty good, they do look pretty good because from 2008 till 2013, you're a consumer founder, you launch a mobile app, chances are you did pretty well. Uh, you were an enterprise uh, software as a service business application founder, you put out there something on the web, you did pretty well more or less. Now it's a little bit harder. So I think Greece uh, could, could, could do uh, uh, really well if we have some individuals that are very much uh, in the beginning of the next wave, whatever that, that is going to be. I don't know if it's going to be crypto or something, but for us to think that a huge mobile app company is going to get built in Greece right now or a massive SaaS company is going to be built out of Greece getting started now, it's unlikely you know, to happen. From uh, the government, what do we need? Simple stuff, like a very easy uh, way to get incorporated, um, a very stable uh, and well understood uh, tax um, uh, code and system for startups that's going to be there for the next 20 years. It's simple stuff, you know, for somebody who lives in the States, you know, to say that. There's a lot of our friends here know. But in Greece, this is uh, taking, you know, a little bit longer to make it happen. and. Maybe, you know, with uh, the help of uh, the Europeans, now some of this stuff is going to get implemented. I have to say, though, for the Greek companies uh, that got started there and got uh, to exit, it was unbelievable windfall for the founders because mm -hmm. the tax code is not sophisticated enough in Greece. So there's no such concept of, like, taxing capital gains because nobody has them. So these folks <laughs> had a much better personal, you know, like, uh, windfall um, rather than if they were, you know, to be based in the States. Um, we now have plenty of capital. This used to be a concern, like till five years ago. Other than some high net worths who had no idea, no sophistication about investing in tech startups, there was nobody. Now, thanks to the um, European uh, Investment Fund, we have 200 million bucks or euros, which is insane. This is more than the market can bear. Yeah. Like, this is so much uh, capital. Is there enough talent for that money to be put into? No, there's not. Not today, unless you do stuff uh, uh, that's very creative Inter along the lines of what right, uh, Chris said. Yeah, invest in the diaspora. So hopefully a lot of you, if you want to raise capital today for your startup, go and talk to the Greek fund. Yeah, it's like the easiest way to get started because there is not uh, a huge pipeline uh, for them over there. The only, um, uh, the only drawback is that you would need to get incorporated in Greece or Cyprus and have an office there, which is not the best, as Chris said, in terms of culture in the very beginning when you're getting started. So ton of capital. The investors there are learning on the fly. There's some good examples of 
companies that have gotten funding from overseas investors. So capital is sold in my mind. Yeah. So Gosh, wouldn't it be? In a scary way, I think. Um, obviously, it's good to have capital, uh, but smarter capital and better deployed capital, it's, is, we're going to see a lot of um, misdeployments uh, like we did five years ago when the first round of 70 million was deployed, and now it's a lot more. You, everyone's going to learn on the fly, and that's why everyone needs to be patient, because it's going to take a long time for everyone to fail again and again, and, and hopefully do it again and again to, to come out strong. But I'm, I'm not as hopeful uh, with, with all the money that's been deployed, to be honest. I'm a little bit scared of how it's going to be. It does sound like an amazing, pragmatic opportunity for startups to relocate from maybe cities that used to be in the EU that maybe won't be in the EU. <laughs> It's sunnier, for sure. But is it a serious opportunity? It, or is the infrastructure not there? Um, I, I run a startup in Portugal. And um, I went and opened, I set up the company and, and set up the account by putting my credit card into the ATM machine. That was it. In 10 minutes, I, I set up a company. And everything is, is easy to run and easy to manage. In Estonia, you wouldn't even need to be exactly. there. Exactly. Even need to be there. So yeah. unless there is some encouragement and motivation and restructuring and support from the broader ecosystem, I think it's going to be a struggle. Um, yeah. So be, let's be, say be, you're be. invited into the cabinet. You give them a list of things that they need to do right now. What would you ask? Are you offering jobs? I don't think he'd like to do that job. Oh, hell no. Um, but what, what should they be I, aware I'm of? Not, uh, honestly, I'm not a policymaker or, or knowledgeable enough to, to be able to go in. I think there's much smarter people than me that know these things. I, I think they need to take examples from Estonia and Portugal and other places, not from me. Uh, but there is enough documentation. They've actually done, I've seen the study that BCG did for, for the Greek government to to help them understand what they need to change. Whether they implement it or not, I don't know. Uh, whether BCG is the right uh, group to do it for them, I don't know. But I think as they start taking advisors from um, founders and, and people that have been out in the ecosystems, in the other ecosystems, and take advice honestly from them. Um, one of the other companies that I've invested, now, as a side note, yes, all of that is great, but you still need those luminaries that are going to go there and tear down those walls and, and set the example. So one of the other companies that I've invested in, Elias Direct, which is talking later today, they went, they decided to leave London and go set up a car insurance company in Athens. At in the, the best middle, possible time. On, in 2011, when the market completely crashed. And to run a, a car insurance company, you need millions in regulatory capital. It took them so long to convince people to give them money, but they kept fighting and they kept arguing both with the government and with investors, and they set it up, and the company is doing fantastic. But it's an ongoing struggle to fight with the system and with the politics and with everyone around them to make it happen. But you need those crazy ones to do it. So he, he, here's what's missing in my mind big time. So what we're missing is um, individuals who are really, really sharp when it comes to go-to-market strategies, having the business acumen. Because um, if you're in Greece and you are starting a company from there, you're not going to be eager to sell uh, uh, to the local markets. OK, Hellas Direct is probably you know, the only example. But you want to be uh, outward facing from day one. And what we don't have yet is we don't have the individuals who are product managers, marketeers uh, in some of the contemporary companies. And for me, it's an unbelievable opportunity that all of us here in the room and so many more in the Greek diaspora are getting educated and uh, receiving incredible training from working for some of these contemporary uh, companies um, all over the world. And in the next uh, five to 10 years, some of these people, not everybody, is going to be moving back to Greece. I don't think everybody's going to move uh, back to Greece. That's not going to happen. But the few who are going to make the jump could make a huge difference in the nascent Greek tech startup ecosystem, which, by the way, it's about 1,000 people strong. That's it. It's not you know, anything massive yet, but compared to 10 years ago, that was like, I don't know, 50 people strong, it's 20x. Israel, it took them 35 years. I remember when I started in venture eight years ago, uh, a lot of other snobby VCs in, in the Valley were saying, oh, don't worry about Israel. Uh, they cannot get um, to have companies that uh, get acquired for north of a billion bucks. 
So you can't make the math work, just focus on Silicon Valley. And with Waze and Mobileye and, and others, now there is a, a litany of successes. But it I'll, took them 35 years. I'd like to take two or three questions from the room. So indicate if you have a question for the team. The only rules are, first of all, tell us who you are briefly. And second of all, your question needs a question mark. So there is a microphone roving around if anybody wants to start. Don't be shy. So where's your apartment in Athens? Yeah. Elysia. Oh, great. Nice neighborhood and cheap. I'm from London, where it's like 20,000 euros per square meter. But it's an issue that Berlin has benefited from. Low rents Absolutely. brought in talent from elsewhere in Europe. The rents have now climbed. But is it not an opportunity for the Athens ecosystem in particular to sell itself internationally within Europe? Cheap rent, great lifestyle, weather is there, and an opportunity. Should there not be a centralized, kind of government-funded campaign to do this? Buses driving around London saying move to, move to Athens like the, the Germans and French did. Perhaps. Maybe the darker, colder bits of Northeast <laughs> Europe. What you're finding in Lisbon is a lot of people are coming from yeah. Eastern Europe to get the sunshine yeah. and the low rents. Yeah, I think you can. Anybody yet got some courage to ask a question? We're not going to build an ecosystem if you just keep quiet. <laughs> Tell us who you are. Mark Wick, Hello. Yeah. Hello. Anyway, I'll ask other. Oh, I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm Marcos uh, from the Reload Risk team. Um, I guess who here wants to start a startup or has a startup or wants to do something? There you go. That's great. And like, okay, you have like two venture capitalists, one from the US, one from the UK, and you have no questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, there you go. Stand up, please, your name, and I'm coming over with my microphone. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Margarita, and I am a social entrepreneur here in London. So my question to you is that given that, you know, we are realizing that in Greece the, the problem is systemic, and obviously, like, you know, I, I can see as a social entrepreneur, I'm feeling quite frustrated all the time that all the money is constantly going only to tech and high-growth startups. Isn't there prospect to actually start creating um, kind of supporting startups or kind of like, you know, social enterprises or charities like Reload Greece, who are trying to support incubating this talent to create the, the sort of kind of people we need to propel us into the next stage. Since like, you know, the, the government is not actually doing this at the moment uh, fast enough to catch up with what is going on in the world. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely you know, room uh, for what you just described to happen. And there is a good example, actually, of a group called Metavalon that got started as a, um, a very um, I interesting incubator uh, supporting uh, local um, students or uh, local researchers uh, with their early needs to um, fund uh, and incubate their companies. These folks had a social enterprise mission in the beginning, as, as far as uh, I know, and they received some funding from the Stavros Nyarhos Foundation and others. Uh, and now they're one of the four or five funds that received uh, a lot of euros from the European Investment Fund. Um, and I can mention a few other uh, names, but of course, uh, you would have to hustle a lot uh, in order to raise the required capital to get started. And then given that the market is very small, um, how are you going to differentiate yourself? Because there are already three, four players that are um, in the same you know, um, market fighting for the very limited pool of talent. Nico, Chris, we don't have very much time. But we've heard from the room that there's a lot of entrepreneurial ambition. A lot of people are building or planning to build startups. Um, now, you've shared the qualities in the entrepreneurs you're looking for. but. Give them one piece of advice that will help them ensure 
it's one of the very few startups that makes it through to series A, B, C success. Chris. Um, for me, it's never take no for an answer and, and keep fighting. There's, a, there's actually a, a slide deck that uh, one of the founders of Last Direct put up on uh, SlideShare that shows how many um, initial outreaches they did in the thousands, how many um, meetings they actually took, how many follow-up meetings, and it's over the, the course of two and a half years it took them to actually for, <coughs> raise their first round, two and a half years to raise their first round of capital. They kept fighting. It's, to make it through, it's a hustle, and you have to keep on hustling, and if you don't believe in yourself, no one is gonna believe in you to, to do it along with you. And, that's another attribute we look for. If we see that you're going to give up on the first hurdle or second hurdle, why would we jump in? Hmm. Nico. So for me, what I would say is um, everybody who wants to do a startup is one incredible mentor advisor away from being perceived as a safe bet. So the hardest challenge that somebody has when they're getting started for, from a, especially at a non-branded ecosystem like in Greece, is that they have no credibility. But if you're insanely passionate, as Chris noted, about what you're doing, understand your customer really well, can hassle, you just need one person who is gonna help connect you to either customers or investors or your first co-founder. And I've seen that story again and again, especially where I am. There are individuals who have one very strong, incredible relationship in life personal life that has kept giving for like decades in their career. To which I would add, build a great network because that will lift you up. And you are starting to do that at Reload Greece. Today is going to be a really valuable day and it's going to lead to lots of value being created in a year, two years, five years. Thank you very much, Chris and Nico. Thank you.